Welcome to the analysis.news. I'm Colin Bursantis. You may have noticed that while natural scientists are focused on the ecological costs of climate change, social scientists and politicians seem much less concerned with the economic costs. According to renowned Australian economist Steve Keen, the reason is terrifying. Dr. Keen has been going through the works of the most mainstream neoclassical economists on whom our politicians base their projections and looking at how they're arriving at their numbers regarding climate change. He has found that they repeatedly confuse climate, the foundation of our energy and food, with the weather, with some of the biggest names even stating that 87% of the economy won't really be affected by climate change because the jobs are primarily indoors. This is such a fundamental and apocalyptic mistake that it leaves little room for reform. Dr. Keen argues that we must simply abandon these economists and their framework, saying it's us or them. Steve Keen has a history of calling out junk economics. He correctly and famously predicted the 2008 recession and spent the years leading up to the subprime mortgage crisis berating mainstream economists for failing to account for the role of private debt and credit. If he says we need to sound the alarm, we should probably pay attention. Steve Keen, welcome to the analysis. Thank you. There's a very good introduction. Very thorough. Um, I want to make sure that I'm framing your position correctly, because mm. I'm familiar with the pernicious influence of big money on politics and economics. Mm. But you're saying the problem runs much deeper than just corruption. And that's why we can't swap out the good neoclassical economists for the bad ones. It is simply what they believe. Uh, it, it's they do, the, the people think that uh, people who are critical of economics from, and from the outside of the profession often think that economists are shrills for the capitalists, that sort of thing. I've seen that quite regularly on Twitter, of course. And that's that that's getting the horse before the cart because, in fact, a training in neoclassical economics, if you accept it, if you believe it, ends up making you uh, effectively a zealot for your vision of what capitalism is. And you will then you you really have a belief in capitalism as the ideal social system, and therefore, if you see anything which challenges the sustainability of capitalism, it's an automatic tendency to reject it. And of course, that can benefit the uh, the capitalist class, uh, but it's not why they do it. And and this is what's happened in this particular case. No one paid William Nordhaus to assume that eighty seven percent of the economy would be unaffected by climate change because it happens in carefully controlled environments. That's his own uh, attitude to capitalism, that it's just, you know, given their model of how capitalism functions, it's an infinitely flexible system, uh, therefore it can cope with anything, therefore climate change can't be a problem. And that mindset is what has determined their uh, the, the predictions they've made, which are so badly based that they should simply be thrown in the garbage bin and that's, of course, what I'm trying to explain to, to policymakers and media and so on. So let's take a look at what they mean by climate within these models mm. and what, say, a natural scientist would call climate. Let's make sure we're not making the same mistake that they're making. Well, to some extent, I think we can blame how climate is defined in conventional uh, organizations like, for example, NOAA, the National Office of Oceanic Administration, I think it stands for, a wonderful acronym. I may have got the actual title there wrong. And they say that, you know, weather is what you experience on a day-by-day -day basis. Climate is the average of weather over a long period of time. And that really makes it seem, you know, that climate and, and weather are statistically uh, different distributions, uh, but the same basic data set. So, you know, weather's a particular day and climate's over a range of days. And that's fundamentally misleading uh, when it comes down to what climate change actually means. To me, I think about climate as the actual structure of the uh, fluid flows in the oceans and the atmosphere of planet Earth. Mm -hmm. And to me, climate change, for example, would mean going from the three circulation cells that currently set the weather patterns in each of the two hemispheres of the planet, North and South Hemisphere. So you have a cell where there's rising air at zero degrees and falling at 30. Uh, that's the, the, the Hadley cell. Then you have what's called the ferrous cell, which has um, you know, falling and rising at 30 and 60, and then the, uh, the polar is 60 to 90. And that's why you have such substantial temperature differences between the, the tropics, the temperate zone, and the polar zone, and relatively consistent temperatures inside each of those zones. Now, if that flips over, and it has flipped over frequently in the Earth's past due to natural factors, of course, if that flips over to a single cell, uh, then what you'll have is rising air at the at the poles and for, at the, at the uh, equator 
and falling air at the poles, and in the middle, effectively, generally speaking, a drought, a desert. Uh, now, that's climate change. Uh, and, and so that is a structural change to the, to, the, to the patterns of fluid flows in both the oceans and the air that generate the weather we feel on a daily basis. And there's no way that there's, uh, it, it is not an average anymore. It's a complete change of the, the system that generates the weather. That's what climate change is. Can you go through the disparity between the kind of description you've just given, the kind of description we might expect from a natural scientist, and the projections that these neoclassical economists are making? Well, the description that the scientists are giving is existential. Right. Uh, if we exceed, and even they're saying it, they're, they're giving vague numbers because, of course, this has never been done before, not only in the history of humanity, but also in the history of the planet. Uh, we've never had as rapid a change in the carbon dioxide levels as we're forcing on the on the planet right now. And of course, there are various structures which have evolved over time in our current climate, the Holocene climate, uh, such as the uh, the, the uh, Arctic, Arctic having summer sea ice. So the Arctic reflects 90% of the energy that falls on it during summer. Uh, the Greenland, you know, similar reflector of energy. Antarctica, the same in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, the circulation patterns of the, in the Great Ocean uh, thermo, thermohaline circulation, which is a you know an oceanic river, hundreds of times the volume of all the rivers, the continental rivers on the planet. So all those all those huge structural elements, that's the defining nature of the climate. And what they're saying, what scientists are saying, is that if we increase the temperature by as little as one degree, we could trigger a breakdown in each of many of those uh, characteristics of the current climate. And that would then cause a cascade. The scientists have been saying numbers like don't let it increase more than two or three degrees. The most recent paper by Kemp and co, I think in, 19, in 2021 or 2022, came out saying three degrees is their limit for absolutely unsustainable uh, temperature increase. But you see figures as low as 1%. We've already exceeded 1%. So the scientists are speculating, but they're all the speculations say anything above that level, you're talking about such a change in the climate that we could no longer sustain the sedentary human civilization we've had for the last 12,000 years. Our agricultural system could be destroyed and therefore the carrying capacity, the carrying capacity of the planet call fall from the area of 8 billion as we currently have down to 1 billion if we're lucky. Now that means 7 billion people die. Wow. So that's, that's the scale that the scientists are talking about. Economists, on the other hand, are saying, and this is quoting Nordhaus, a six degree increase in temperature will cause an 8.9% fall in GDP compared to what it would be in the complete absence of climate change. If you look at the most recent IPCC report, Working Group 2, Chapter 16, is the economics chapter inside there. And that chapter said that a, a four degree increase in temperature by 2100, four degrees Celsius, could cause between a 10 and 23% fall in GDP compared to what it would be in the absence of climate change. And that, that therefore means they're assuming growth for the next 80 years, which would increase per capita incomes by a factor of five. And they're saying rather than being five times as large, they'll be four times as large, which is trivial. Wow. So that's the difference. One is saying a, a minor decline in overall productive capacity while it still grows over time, uh, where the scientists are saying we, we won't have a civilization past certainly past four degrees most scientists i know if you suggest four degrees level of warming they're saying forget it it's it's human civilization is over right at that level wow wow yeah, yeah. that's that's a disparity all right um mm, huge it's 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 enormous and i think uh for those who do not know who who nordhaus is and who some of these mm. figures are uh these are not this is not a case of say big tobacco finding some fringe person somewhere who will accept a bribe to say something crazy. These yeah. are the most mainstream figures. Yeah, well, so Nordhaus, first of all, he has taken over the mantle of publishing the one of the dominant textbooks, Paul Samuelson textbook. He is now the continuing editor of the Samuelson textbook on economics. He was, he was elected uh, president of the Economic Association at some time in the last few years. I've forgotten when that actually was. And he got the Nobel Prize so-called Nobel Prize for Economics in 2018. So he's high status in, in the profession. And he 
and, and a group of economists. It's only a very small band of economists, by the way. And this is one thing I, I try to emphasize to the profession. I say, for God's sake, ditch Nordhaus, because if you don't ditch Nordhaus, you'll be responsible for when, when, when the shit hits the fan and the shit is coming, uh, you will be economics in general will be responsible for letting this garbage and frankly that's the only way i can describe it this garbage get published because if you had decent refereeing of papers on the basis of the science of climate change being applied to these economic papers none of them would have been published i want to delve a little further into some of the uh examples that you talk about as you go through the papers that these people have published the statements that they've Hmm. made um, the 87% number that's given, uh, one of them yeah. about the Gulf Stream, which is absolutely terrifying. Uh, can you go through some of the kind of extreme falsities that are being published on a very wide scale right now? They have about four methods they've used to make up, and I, I emphasize make up numbers, mm-hmm. okay? not generate data, but make up numbers that then they say are related to climate change. So the very first was what they call the enumerative method. And the, the enumerative method, the way they describe it is that they take uh, data from science papers and and add up the damages that science papers say, and then you, you're adding up from the bottom up. So that's that's what they call the enumerative method. Now, when you take a look at Nordhaus 1991, to slow or not to slow, the economics of the climate change, published in the Economic Journal, which is published by Oxford University, one of the certainly one of the top three or top five journals in economics in 1991. Mm-hmm. And then he said that... Uh, there are some activities such as microprocessor fabrication or open heart surgery, which occur, occur in carefully controlled environments. That's literally a quote, uh, which will not be particularly subject to climate change. On the other hand, there are other activities which are exposed to the weather and therefore exposed to climate change. He said our estimate, meaning his estimate, our estimate is that 87 percent of American, the American economy is will be negligibly affected by climate change because it takes place in carefully controlled environments. Now that was when you look at the table here, which is table 15 in that particular table paper, I think it was all of manufacturing, all of wholesale and retail services, all of the finance sector, most of real estate, except for a small amount of coastal real estate. And he even included mining apparently not being aware that a lot of mining is open cut and therefore exposed to the weather. Uh, so that that is the scale of it. And you would hope that it would just be an aberration that got through, but later papers fixed it up. Instead, that was being maintained all the way through. And uh, they, they don't use that method anymore, but that's one of the, they haven't rejected the numbers they got out of that. Now, when Nordhaus did his calculations, uh, he, he had 3% of the economy being uh, seriously exposed, which is largely agriculture and forestry, 10% marginally exposed. And when he added up his numbers, he got a total of a 0.26% ch- change in uh, reduction in GDP for a three degree increase in temperature. Wow. Okay. Now, the reason he got that, because he, when it came to the to the section we said would be, would be exposed, which is agriculture and forestry he said he took into account the you know, the fertilizer effect of carbon dioxide so he had somewhere between a plus uh, uh, uh 9.7 and a minus 10.5 and therefore the the average of the two is what he put in as the major source of damages and that's where the 0.26 percent of gdp fall came from and then he said there may be other factors that aren't included here um I might bump it up to 1%, but my hunch, and literally the word hunch in a so-called scientific paper, my hunch is that the damages will be no more than 2% of GDP from three degrees of warming. So that's that's one of their... Wow. Yeah, that, okay. And so that's, that's so a lot of those enumerative method ones come out with damages between positive, actually some of them think their fertilizer effect's really good, you know, uh, positive effects of up to 1%, and R- Richard Toll published one of those papers, down to about uh, mo- a, a 2 or 3% fall in GDP. That's the range that they get. Wow. Uh, second method they call this, they call the statistical method. And this, and this is the, this is the very first paper that I actually saw, and I realized just how deluded they were on climate change. Uh, this is by Richard Toll in 2009 called the economics of climate change and in that paper we describe what he called the statistical approach which is used by mendelssohn who's one of uh, the research colleagues of, of nordhaus he said mendelssohn assumes that the variation of, of 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 gdp with with climate over space will hold over time now what that means is nordhaus uh, mendelssohn in this particular case that at first 
and initially just with with America, they then generalized to a, a global uh, distribution of of income. And looking at say gross state products and average state temperature, you can then get this when you. And I've done this myself as a, it's just a simple exercise to show how stupid this is. If you take a look at the average temperature for every state in mainland America, continental America, and the uh, the average gross the gross state uh, product per capita which is the state version of GDP, then you get a scatter plot. If you if you then graph the temperature on the horizontal and the uh, income on the vertical, you get a scatter plot, which is a huge wide scatter plot. But if you do a quadratic regression on that, and they almost always use quadratics, what they call their damage functions, that quadratic will tell you that uh, each uh, degree increase in temperature reduces your GDP by about 0.3% times the temperature change squared. Now, that therefore means that a 10 degree increase in temperature will cause about a 15% fall in GDP. Well, Ironically, that's a, that's a bigger number than Nordhaus himself uses. So his damage function is that the damage to GDP from temperature increase will be 0.227% uh, times the temperature change. And that's where you get this you know, six degree increase in temperature, about an eight percent fall in GDP. But it's literally using the the geographic nature of climate. So obviously, the climate of Florida is different to the climate of North Dakota. Okay, but that's sitting inside exactly the same temperature distribution for global temperature. There's no change in global temperature between uh, N- Dakota and Florida because they're on the same globe, and they simply assume that that very light variation. Uh, relatively trivial role of temperature in determining GDP will be what climate change does over time. And the craziness of this is that if you think, and I've made this case for a, a research paper, a project I'm working on right now, uh, the reason that you can have a successful economy in Florida and have a successful one in Dakota is they trade with each other. The stuff that North Dakota can't produce that Florida can, the stuff that Florida produces that North Dakota can't, part of the income is because North Dakota is selling products to Florida. Right. Now, you can't sell through time, okay? You can't sell wheat produced in 2020 to people in 2100. Right. So the whole idea that, that you can use what happens over space as an anagram, what happens over time, is just nonsense. And again, it's showing they simply don't understand what climate change actually means. Now, the third method has come along after that, and that is that acknowledging that mistake some economists have said, well, we need to have data where there's change in temperature, change in global average temperature. And we then compare that to either GDP or change in GDP. And that's been done by a, a number of people. Who, there's a paper by Khan and Mahadis and a few others coming out of the International Monetary Fund. Uh, and they they have said, well, there's a nonlinear relationship at the global, at the, at the geographic level between temperature and GDP. So they've worked out what that nonlinear relationship is for change in temperature over over the period 1960 to 2014. I think that's the data set they use. And they've then extrapolated that forward 80 years. Now, that only works if there's no structural change to the climate over the next 80 years, which is nonsense, yeah. because they're talking about that they said that a, a 125th of degree Celsius change in temperature per year which mounts up to 3.2 degrees over the next 80 years, uh, will cause about, a, I think, a 0.05 decline in GDP for each uh, each uh, each year. And therefore, they're saying that uh, there will be a seven. And I love I love the false precision they give. This is supposed to be statisticians. If you this sort of false precision shows you're a child, you don't know really what you're doing. They've said that there will be a 7.22 percent fall in GDP by 2100 from a 3.2 degree increase in in Celsius in temperature. Now they can't even get today's GDP accurate to one tenth of 1%. And here they're trying to predict GDP in 80 years time to two decimal places of accuracy. <laughs> it's just nonsense. Right. So that's the sort of thing there, but those are basically three methods. There's, um, but what, they, what they're doing is, is really saying you can find the footprint for global warming and current data. And that's just nonsense. Okay. Uh, because, you know, it's a cascading effect and it's the runaway process that we are now very, very close to triggering uh, that is the really scary thing. The complete structural breakdown of our climate will occur over the next 80 years. 
And all these predictions are just nonsense. I'm not a particularly religious person myself, but there's a church in my community that's a good actor. And so for several years, I volunteered on its committee uh, as a community partner. Yeah. And um, they were getting hit with thousands of dollars of new insurance costs because of yeah. the increased risk of the world. Absolutely. I mean, this, uh, the, the, the climate instability we're seeing right now, the crazy cold temperatures in America, crazy hot temperatures in Europe, uh, drought in, in California, now it's flood in California. Uh, the, that, that volatility is being generated by the extra energy that we've trapped in the atmosphere courtesy of carbon dioxide. So we're already seeing the real world couldn't give a damn about what economists think. Uh, the real world will do what the, the real world climate does under, under the energy pressure that we're putting on the biosphere. And that is going to make a laughing stock with the predictions of the economists probably in this decade. But it's at some point it'll be bleedingly obvious that their damage estimates have got absolutely nothing to do with what's actually going on. And the damages are far, far higher. And in that situation, anybody who's trusted economists in either directly or indirectly by accepting their uh, damage assessments and then putting that to insurance contracts and so on, they're going to be forced to pay out an absolute fortune uh, and they'll, they'll be bankrupted by the cost of climate change damages. If we want to be able to think about this critically and productively and not make the same mistake as them, what is a good starting point for us to think about uh, what is the role of climate in the economy? First of all, just to handle what sort of changes are being spoken about, what, what is feasible to happen if the temperature rises any further. And I'll, I'll give uh, one of my favourite examples, because it's terrifying, and, and the person who's making it is uh, impeccable credentials. So the Professor of Chemistry at Harvard University, J.G. Anderson, was the person who discovered the hole in the ozone layer in the, in the last century and led the campaign to close the campaign close the hole. So his argument in a paper published in 2017 is that with the decline in the Arctic summer sea ice, that will trigger a breakdown of those three circulation cells. And that will mean that storms which currently develop over the uh, plains of America, particularly the north, the, the, you know, the central plains of America, which are enormous storms, will penetrate the stratosphere. So at the moment, those storms are restricted to the, uh, to the, the um, uh, troposphere, which we're you know, below 20 kilometres where we, we live and work. Uh, if it gets into the stratosphere, it will take moisture into the stratosphere. And the moist, the current of the stratosphere is very, very low levels of H2O. So it's a very dry stratosphere. When that water passes in, it will also carry in chlorine and bromide, partially from our own industrial processes, but also even from volcanoes. And that chlorine and bromide will increase, according to, uh, to uh, Anderson's paper, increase the rate of destruction of ozone by a factor of 100. Hmm. And what that would mean is it's no longer safe to go outdoors. For humans, particular. Other animals with fur, slightly better chances than us. Plants, apparently, have got a fair bit of protection against uh, high levels of UV, but we won't be able to go outdoors. And I'm sorry, that's the end. That's that's the end of human civilization. If we can't, you know, you can't go outdoors during daylight hours, then what happens to our civilization? It breaks down. So, and of course, people will die of skin cancer. Uh, so it's it's an appalling potential now in that situation if that's 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 happening you haven't got an economy right. and so that the existential stuff that I want, I want people to realize is what we're playing with here mm -hmm. um, so that's that's the real danger it's not a case of a, a bit of damage here a few more percent insurance claims stuff like that it's you can no longer manage a a, a human civilization and you couldn't even manage hunting and gathering in that situation because you couldn't afford to hunt during the day so it's 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 existential. That's what I prefer to people to, people to look at rather than we're working in terms of percentages of GDP and damages and so on. That that is that's the game the economists have played, and it's it's also it's a game of correlation, not causation. They have no theory as to how temperature causes GDP. They simply say here's this correlation we've found in current data, and that's what we're going to use to predict the damages of climate change. It's completely irrelevant to what climate change will actually do to human civilization. I'm going to ask you a tough question. Maybe it's too much for this interview. Uh, but my generation has never experienced a real recovery from 2008. Uh, COVID has caused more eco or economic distress. Uh, yeah. we have major companies like Goldman Sachs is already laying people off in anticipation of another downturn. And we're having a conversation about how economists have wildly overestimated how good things are going to be. So is that yeah. we throw out these uh, these neoclassical economists who are making these terrible projections, if we put them aside and start to put 
a different theory in place. Is there some feasible glimmer of sunlight that we can put in front of people to uh, rally behind? Well, the, the main thing is we have to drastically reduce the, the load we put on the planet in terms of the biosphere. So the carbon dioxide is the most obvious damage we're doing, but everything else we do as well. We're, 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 we're dam- dumping plastics, which are damaging uh, food chains throughout out the world. Mm-hmm. We're intruding on what used to be virgin uh, territory. So we're hitting up against that's where the, the the pandemic came from the fact that we're intruding into areas which used to be you know no hum, off limits for humans now we're the we're the we're the best possible host for any pandemic why 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 attack any other animal when humans are so uh prolific and distribute the diseases so well uh so we're making ourselves a target for all these you know elements of the you know, hostile elements of the environment in which we live so there's the only glimmer would be to say, and I don't think it's going to happen. I think we're going to have to go into a catastrophe before we reverse direction. But what we have to say is we have to drastically reduce our load on the planet now. And that means a drastic fall on the consumption levels of the rich. And that can be both global rich, but also rich within each nation state. So it's not the, not the poor who uh, have to reduce, have to consume less, because even in the, in the case of America, something like about 30% of people are living on the breadline. So you can't force them to consume less uh but you have to make the rich consume less and you have to radically and rapidly decarbonize the economy and then you've also got to reduce our load on the planet so that we reserve at least half the planet for non-human life and at the moment we're using 97 percent of the planet you know the only part only parts we're not using the ones that are simply impossible to use such as greenland and antarctica and uh and 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 the 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 tundra regions but everything else we're exploiting to to the hilt and we have to say that no longer can be allowed now i simply don't believe we're going to do it in time people people even if people in in policy listen to me which they won't do uh they would have an they know how hard it would be to sell the sort of message i've got to the public and if they try to sell that message before it becomes obvious it's necessary they'll lose their positions so we won't do anything until we get absolutely obvious catastrophes that have to be blamed on climate change. Nothing else can be considered. And for example, something like a, the breakdown of the ozone layer of the Northern Hemisphere, that would be a wake up call. Now, in that situation, what you have to be, if you don't have any chance of maintaining human civilization through this process, you have to have measures in place that give you a chance to react to whatever catastrophe will come along. So if the catastrophe happens to be a collapse in in wheat production, and that's quite a feasible one from climate change, then you have to have reserves of, of grain already stored in case there's a collapse in the crops, and you have to have a rationing system. So if everybody gets the same ration, you don't have people starving to death because they can't afford to buy the grain. You've got to go from a, a monetary capitalist economy to a ration-based, war-based economy, effectively. But all these things are so gigantic that you have to be prepared to throw a level of our energy, our activity at the planet that will dwarf what we did during World War II. These are going to happen. The question is, they're going to be enforced upon us or we're going to try to manage it. That's not an optimistic note to end on, but perhaps it's the kind of bluntness that we need to deal with a real world with a real climate and not the imagined world of these neoclassical economists. Uh, Steve Keen, this has been a very insightful interview. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Colin.